if you live with anxiety, check yourself. Are you living in the future too much? Are you wishing for a life that you currently don't have? That you see other people living vicariously through somebody else? If that's the case, step back and... Yeah, look around. Detach a little bit. Look around. be present. Yeah. Just be present. Go hug your wife. Go hug your kids. I guarantee you that anxiety will go away. This episode is sponsored by Southern Utah Safe and Vault. It's one-stop shop, buy, education, delivery, everything you need with the safe or a vault door. Website is safesfirst.com. Their showroom is 1397 West, Sunset Boulevard, number 115 in St. George, Utah. Phone number is 435-767-7878. Hey guys, welcome back to the Derek Leg Podcast. I am your host, Derek Leg. We are in the vault again today, episode 79. Um, we have brought a fellow podcaster in today. So it's going to be cool. I want him to talk a little bit about his in the beginning, and then we'll just kind of dive into his stories as a great story. Um, we've also had Brandon Neal, Jeff Fieldstead on the podcast. They also have their own now that's called solid and Alex Cornwall is our guest today and he was on theirs as well. So you're, yeah. you're very well versed in the podcast world. Now have your own and everything. I don't know about well versed, but <laughs> Hey, we're just going through the motions and just putting it out there. So yeah, no, yeah. Dude, thanks for coming on. Appreciate well, thank, it. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. It's uh sometimes we have things planned out for a month and sometimes we have things planned out for a day. So hey. you were one that we were able to fit in and, and I appreciate it. I'm always excited to share stories and thoughts and whether they're right or wrong. I really don't care. They're my thoughts, your but thoughts. it is what it is. Yeah. So that's what I love. I, I've, been that way. Like in high school, I was that way Mm -hmm. and people loved me or they hated me. It's like you either knew where I stood or you didn't like how I told you. (laughs) You (laughs) And that's up to them. That's not as anything to do with you. That's on them. So yeah. Well, it's funny too. I don't know how you felt, feel or felt about it, but when I was that age, um, like confidence wasn't a thing at 17. Like I I didn't, I didn't really know what it meant, but I had like a fake confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, at the time I thought it was confidence but now I know it was just like a fake confidence where I, and that's, was my thought. I didn't care what you thought. Like I was who I was. Um, like my best friend, Alex, we it's got a good name. Yeah. <laughs> my best friend, Alex Stout. So our, our nicknames were like, I was D's nuts and he was a stout. Okay. So we'd always say, we don't care what you think about D's nuts and a stout. Like we're just who we are. Yeah. Right. And so it always built like this false confidence, but a lot of my structure was built on top of that yeah. as a 17 year old. I, you know? well, I honestly think back then it's more, it, it, you're right. It wasn't confidence. It's more cockiness than anything. Sure. Like I am the shit. This is who <laughs> I am. La, la, la. You know what I'm saying? And then you realize and then life slaps you in the face. You're like, oh crap, this is what life is. Right. You know? And then that, wait a second, am I doing the right thing? And that's when you start like going life and going through with the struggles and the, and what, what really defines who you become and who you are. You know, cool. but I, it's all that cockiness. Yeah. I was, I was cocky too. But I think, I think that, and it's what kids, I believe what kids struggle with nowadays that are that age is they mm-hmm. don't have not even, they don't even have fake confidence or no. whatever you want to call it. They don't have anything. And I because think that's why that generation's kind of lost. It's because they're looking for everything on this for satisfaction. Their their validation. Want, and, validation, satisfaction, everything. Oh, who's, who's liking my posts? Who's liking this? Who's liking that? They want that instant gratification. Whereas back when, I mean, how old are you? I'm 33. 33. So what year did you graduate high school? I I can't do math. Oh, seven. You know? So you were kind of there. Like I, I graduated in 99. And so cell phones back then, if you had a cell phone, you're like, oh, daddy was rich. Yeah. My brothers had pagers. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And so we didn't have that kind of stuff. And so you actually had to go seek gratification. You actually had to go earn it. Right. You know? Whereas now, oh, I got a like. Ooh, gratification. Yeah. You know? So I think that's what's helping or what's making it these kids nowadays aren't having that and knowing how to build confidence because of that. Cause they're not actually getting uncomfortable going out there serving and getting actual gratification right? from something they actually did. And that's they take how you a damn build picture it. and that's it. Yeah. That's how you build confidence. Exactly. Yeah. Get uncomfortable. So, so and we're just diving right into I know. this. <laughs> there you go. What's uh? I mean, what do you think? Cause I, I, I look back and I think, well, is that just the generation now? Like, is that just what kids are? Is there a fix? Is, 
are we supposed to adapt to that? So I have a two year old. I don't know if you have kids. I have six. Six kids. I have a blended family. Good for you, so man. four from a previous marriage and now two. Okay. You know, um, stepsons. And so we got a big family. Yeah. I mean, so kids range are all, all the way from 22 all the way down to nine. Okay. You know, between all of them. And so I've got the whole gamut, you know, in between teenagers, everything. And I don't know. That's a good question. Like, is that just what we're there? I think, you know, and I don't want to bad talk any parents or anything like that because it is tough being a parent. Sure. I mean, you're a parent. Yeah. I'm a parent. It did, there wasn't a book that popped out with the kid <laughs> when, when they were born. It's like, Hey, here's your, your user manual. You right. know, and here here's, you go. here's all six of them. Exactly. Because they're all different. <laughs> exactly. It's like, there wasn't a, there wasn't a, a manual for it. So who knows? I, but I honestly think it's teaching the kids what true confidence, like you were talking about, what true work, what true, you know, happiness comes from. Happiness comes from delayed gratification and it's a choice. And I don't think that's taught right now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't think that that many adults are happy right now in this world. Yeah. I think all that transition started probably around my age. Yeah. Um, definitely kids younger than me. Yeah. Um, but around my age, that's where all that, that's where social media started, right? Mm -hmm. Like you had a MySpace and then Facebook and everything else. And it's easy to get sucked into. Yeah. I mean, really think about it. Like I get sucked into it. I'm not perfect at this. And that, that's what I'm talking about. It's like, I even struggle with it sometime where you just got showing, you're like, you know, 20 minutes go by. He's like, shit, what am I doing? Like, yeah. I'm just wasting my life, <laughs> you know? But then, but the thing is I'm still scrolling, even when I'm telling myself that. And it's like, okay, if it's that bad for me, how bad is it really for those kids? Right. When you have an internal dialogue, you exactly. can change that, flip that switch. Exactly. So I think it's just more rearing and, and guiding those kids that, look, life's tough. No one's going to come out and save you. No one's going to come out and do it for you. You got to do it. Ultimately, it's going to be you. Yes, I support my kids. I'm there for them. I want them to succeed. But ultimately, it's their hard work that's going to make it or break it for them. Yeah. And it's teaching them that. Yeah. You know what I'm and saying? I like the delayed gratification because that's where... I mean, put that to money, put that to a job, put that to studying, put that to whatever. Oh, anything. And like, that's what it comes out as. I mean, really look at anybody that's really been successful in this world. Like, let's take Bezos, for example. Bezos, whatever, how, yeah. however you say his name. You know, Amazon. You got to remember, he started in the late 80s. And it was just a vision and idea. Hey, I'm going to do this online store. Online bookstore. A bookstore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, people thought he was nuts. Like, first and foremost, what's the internet back then? Yeah. Second, I'm going to do it that and, you know, roll 40 years later, 20 years, well, however long that is, he's now the richest man in the world. It didn't happen overnight, but so many people think he did do it overnight. No, it, he, it took him most of his life to get to where he is today. Right. Delayed gratification. Yeah. And he's, he's touching in a way, almost every household, if not every out household in America and, and I mean, everybody knows else. who yeah. Amazon is, what Amazon is. I mean, you've ordered from there. That's what I mean. That was like, now he's got his fingers in everything that anyone does on a daily basis. Hell, if I don't have an Amazon package at my house on a weekly basis, there's something wrong in my yeah. household. <laughs> You're calling the post office we, wondering if someone died. We keep Amazon in business. <laughs> yeah. Okay. With all of our kit, everything that we really do. I mean, we're, but it's so convenient. Again, yeah. he's taken his delayed gratification and he serves and hits the instant gratification for us that need it now. That's interesting, huh? Think about that. <laughs> and <laughs> he makes flipped a that billion dollars, billions of dollars doing it. Yeah. So. So where do you think that starts though? Is it a, well, so let me, let me kind of back up. So I've always thought with my kid, before, when my wife was pregnant and when we kind of talked about having kids, I was like, no screens, no phones, no iPads, no nothing. Like I want him to have somewhat of a normal life. Like I had, like we had. NES and mm -hmm. N64 oh, and right. Oh yeah. And, but our parents would like somewhat monitor it, but we were always outside working, playing basketball, football, whatever. So I kind of thought that with my son. And then I, I did a lot of studying. I've uh, a lot of, uh, Rogan, Elon Musk, like all these people. And it makes me think, well, I'm almost like handicapping him mm -hmm. if I don't let him have, cause I, I can hardly work a computer, right? Yeah. I can't, I can't type, <laughs> you know, I'm hunting peck. I'm all that. And I'm like, am I handicapping him from what his future is going to look like versus what I thought my 
childhood was? You know, you actually bring up a really good point there. And I think there is that fine line that you're talking about, but I do believe that you still can use technology for good. Like we're hearing so much right now, like TikTok and, and all the social media platforms are horrible for kids. Well, it really all depends. Let them use it, but are we monitoring what they see and watch? Like when I pull up my Instagram, I use it for good. I use it for uplifting, motivational, you know, you go through my feed and it's programmed because it, the algorithm and everything where I have like the Ed Milets coming on all the time, the Bradley is, and, and people that inspire me to grow quotes and good, good, wholesome things. So if we're monitoring our kids' social media for that reason, we it can be a good influence to them, but are we stepping up as parents to actually monitor it and do it? Yeah. And put that structure there for and, them. And I'll be honest with you. I'm not perfect. Like, I don't remember the last time I had to be honest with you. This is a good thing. I'm just thinking, I was like, <laughs> oh, crap, dude, I need to go. Yeah, it's been a minute. I, it's been a minute. I need to go <laughs> check my kids' phones, you know? Um, but I honestly think it starts, it, it does start in the household. And it does start with us monitoring, help them realize that, look, there's bad ways to use it. There's good ways, just like the internet. Yep. There's bad ways to use it. There's good ways to use it. Let me show you how we, it can, we can actually use it to benefit your life Yeah. versus destroy your life. Yeah. It's having this talk with my, my grandparents were just here. They left today, um, 80, they're in their eighties. Yeah. And then my oldest brother, who's around your age, I think he's a year younger than you. And they were just bagging internet, right? Like how crappy it is, how it's screwing the world, how the kids are ruined from it. And, and I kind of said, and I just, I kind of sat there and let them talk about it and I said, you know what? It just depends. Like you can, you can use a hammer for good or you can use a hammer for bad. You can exactly. use a gun for good, a gun for bad. You can use the internet for good. You can use the internet for bad. Like it, how are you focusing on and using your time on that tool or platform or whatever? Exactly. Are you wasting time or are you using it to benefit your time? Like, yeah. Like you said, it's all about perspective. Well, when you said you, you get scrolling and you're, you're 20 minutes in and you're still going, I'm like, dude, I've had that too, but I'm going through Rogan, Goggins, Ed Milet, exactly. Andy Frisella, you know, and there's some things that the algorithm throws in there too, like Theo Vaughn. I get a lot of Theo <laughs> Vaughn all of a sudden, you yeah. know, and Bill Burr and some things like that too, but sports, like exactly. sports come through. And so you're right. It's like, if you go through that, you can, you can kind of tweak the algorithm to set it up to at least have wholesome, positive, whatever word you want to put to it, things coming through your stream yeah. in different clips. And honestly, with these kids nowadays, I think they've got an advantage versus, you know, people like us. Well, we're learning the curve right now, but they're growing up in an age where, I mean, how many kids that are 12, 13, 14 are grasping the concept of social media and already going out and building businesses. Yeah. And making money and and providing not only for them, but their parents, their family, and everybody like that. And so I think they have an advantage if, again, it all comes down to if we're teaching them correctly. Yeah. If we're giving them that entrepreneurial mindset of, hey, you can go do whatever you want in life. It's going to take hard work and dedication. Go do it. If it's social media you want to do, if it's it's if it's making a TikTok, do the best damn TikTok talk you can. Then. Yeah. You know, if it's, if it's going out there and building a business online, an e-commerce business, go do it to the best of your ability. Don't half-ass it. Yeah. Do you know, do you yeah. follow Eric Thomas at all? Oh yeah. Hip, okay. The hip hop preacher. Yeah, so I love Eric. One of his first podcast episodes and his, his running mate is slipping my mind, but, um, anyway, they had a little snippet and it's always stuck with me. And this was years ago before I'd even thought about having kids, um, it came across that his kid wanted to watch YouTube, right? Yeah. And so he turns YouTube on and he's watching another kid play with toys, mm -hmm. which is very common. Um, I still don't understand it, but it's a thing, right? Yep. And so he, so he's sitting there watching his kid watch this other kid. And he instantly snapped out of it and said, hey, man, if this is what you want to do, I want to make you be a producer, not a consumer. And so he switches that. That night they started, you know, little Billy's... Pod, or exactly. little Billy's YouTube channel, whatever it was. Right. And so that's always stuck with me. It's like, okay, as you're raising them and being an entrepreneur, it's, he needs to have that mindset of, okay, you can sit there and consume the internet, mm -hmm. social media, whatever, 
or I can turn around and produce exactly internet. And there's there there still is a fine line there though the the, the addiction part of it. Sure. Where you really got to be careful. Like I've got a little boy right now. His, his name's Dax. Uh, my littlest one. He's nine. He's obsessed with video games. Like obsessed. And I monitor when he's down here because he lives with his mom in Salt Lake most okay. of the time. But w- I get him quite a bit. Like I've got a great re- relationship and everything. And when he's down here, he's always asking to play video games and stuff. And I monitor. I was like, no, go outside first, play or do something else. And then maybe after you're done with that. So there is that fine line. But one thing that they've done up north is he really loves video games. He's actually learning to code right now at nine years old, like video games. And I was like, okay, that's cool. You know, use it for good. Right. I honestly think it pushes his mind. It helps him grow, helps, you know, is it, do I love it that he's in front of a screen? No, but But again, that's going to be his future. Yeah. Well, and is he setting, you know, goals and having accomplishments and that's the next, is he building his confidence off of it? (laughs) That's the next step with him. (laughs) Right. He's, he's a work in pride. I love my little boy. But all nine year olds are. Yeah, but you. So. But that's what I mean, though, is you could tweak that exactly. to anything, and maybe you and I don't understand coding video games, but it oh. can, it can set achievements for him. Yeah, and he can build confidence off of that. Where yeah. we might have built it off of catching a football or hitting free throws. Exactly. Right. No, you're exactly right. So, and so, so yeah, I, and and the only reason I bring it up is because I don't know. I mean, I, like I said, I have a two year old. I'm going through it, so it's always an interesting conversation yeah. to have. Guess what, man been doing it for a long time. I don't know either. It's a, it, there's always a new curveball when it comes to kids. Yeah. And that's one thing I love about them. Love it, dude. All right, let's jump into you, man. Tell okay. me a little bit about the <laughs> podcast you got going, okay. how long you've been doing it. Um, and then just a little bit about you and you we'll kind of dive in. So I started, I've always wanted to start up. Well, it's been, I shouldn't say always. It's been about a year and a half. I had this idea. I was like, man, I would really like to do a podcast. But I've always was scared, like, okay, but who am I to <laughs> yeah. put myself out there? Who am I to interview people? Who am I to to give advice kind of thing and all that? And I was like, you know what? Screw it. And there was actually a group of people up north the very first. They're like, Alex, you need to do this. And they kind of pushed me to do it. I didn't really want to. They just like, hey, we're going to help you do this and you're doing it. So I created and started the Purpose Driven Podcast. Um a lot of people ask me why, why purpose driven. And there's a reason why I call it the purpose driven. Um, I believe everybody that's successful or that, and I don't define success as just monetary wealth. Like, I don't care if you work a nine to five. I don't, if you are happy and if you love what you do and you feel fulfilled, that's success, success to me. Okay. Okay. But there has to be purpose behind there. There has to be a why or a driving factor behind it before anybody even gets started. Okay. I want to know, I started that because I'm just intrigued to understand and know why people do what they do. And that's why I started it because I knew why I wanted, why purpose for me was so important. You know, my purpose came from just, I'm alive, you know, coming from a guy that's, you know, been through the depths and hell and back it, I'm 40 years old and I've, I've lived a full life already. Um, you know, I've tried to commit suicide twice and it was after that second time trying to commit suicide that I realized that purpose is, is it, everybody has purpose. I have my son at the time, at that point, he saved my life because he had purpose in me. And that's when I was like, man, everybody's driven by this purpose. What's well, mine. And it took me a few years and back 2018, 19, I decided to develop my purpose. And I think it's something we develop over and over and over again. It's not defined. It's something that grows with us and pivots and changes. Um, And I want to know what other people, and that's why I started. I was like, okay, I'm interested in why people do what they do. And so I started the Purpose Driven Podcast. It's been going only like four months now or five months, not, not that long. Okay. I've had maybe a dozen episodes, but it has taken off and, and I'm getting a lot of success from it and I love doing it. It scares the out of me <laughs> when I'm doing it because again, I have that imposter syndrome come on going like, dude, who are you to do something like this? But I always tell myself when I, when I catch myself telling me that I'm always saying, well, who aren't you? Mm. Because the whole purpose of me doing it was if I can go help at least one person and it helps them in their life and it helps them grow and get out of the funk that they're in and maybe give them a positive perspective, 
I've done my job. That's a win. Yeah. It's a win. So I really don't care what people say anymore. I really don't care what people think to an extent. I still struggle, you know, but ultimately I don't do it for them. I do it for the person that does want to listen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, but yeah, I, I love it. It's fun. Um, so what else you got? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I just want to touch in there too. I, yeah. I feel the same way with my podcast. We've been a year and a half and, I mean, we've missed like two weeks and a year and a half. And when I, I, I had friends, dude, you need to start one. You need to start one. And I've told the story on here before. So I want to, you know, just regurgitate every episode, but that's what it was for me. I was like, okay, but if I, I had a guy ask me that was on recently, why do you do this? Mm -hmm. And he said, I can't imagine you're making money doing it. It's not like a, an income stream for you. And I said, you know, one may, one day it might be, if it, if we got to the point where, you know, production costs were getting paid. Awesome. But I mean, this has costed, cost me money every month for a year and a half. And, and I said, you know what? I, I've always had the opportunity to work. I've always had a job. I've always had, you know, something in front of me to make a paycheck. And my wife and I are in a spot right now that, uh, with our, one of my businesses, we have some extra income. Yeah. And so that's kind of why I started this. I thought, okay, you know, if it takes X amount of dollars to do this and bring people on that, I mean, it's like you, right? Like I, I come across so many people that I'm like, dude, you've got to tell your story. Like exactly. you've got to do this. And it, it's not for me. Like the Derek po leg podcast isn't for me. It's because I want to get people on here and tell their story. Yeah. And I loved how there's just so many everyday people that have these incredible stories and things that they've been through. And, and, you know, like you were saying, uh, Sue had thought about taking your life twice. Uh, my dad did take his life a couple of years ago. And it's hard to hear that. I just think about there's so many things that people are going through and I don't want them to feel alone. Yeah. And I want, if, if all it is, is, you know, tripping across that TikTok, you know, clip of someone talking that helped them mm -hmm. in that moment, that's worth whatever it costs me to do this. I think people relate to people. People relate to stories. And we don't know if you're going to relate or not unless you share that story. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, I learned really quick when I started sharing my story, although very uncomfortable to share it, I realized that it did resonate with people like you're saying. And I was like, it doesn't hurt me because my past, it happened. It's the truth. It is what it is. And like I was saying before, if I could help one person, you know, I think one of the most fulfilling texts that I get and I get them yeah. even to this day are the guys and it, it's usually guys, you know, men, because we're to, so scared to share our feelings and our emotions. Like we were talking about before reaching out to me saying, Alex, I've really contemplated this and you're, you're giving me hope that tomorrow's going to come. Yeah. I mean that right there keeps me going, going, okay, I need to do this at a higher level. Because how many people haven't heard my podcast or haven't heard the stories or the people I'm bringing on and that have taken their life already? I think about the people I've already lost. And will we save everybody? No. All right. No. But I think it's needed more than ever regular, normal people sharing their story. There's nothing special about me. I, I, there's not. I mean, I'm a middle-aged man from Southern Utah, St. George, Utah, that... <laughs> that struggled for 15 years of his life, been through a divorce, tried to commit suicide, and now is seeing success because of his mindset shift and change. I mean, that's pretty much in a nutshell and a really yeah, quick, yeah. that's my story. But how many people are going through that exact same thing that need to know that, hey, just one more day. That's all you got to do is just go one more day. Yeah. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, literally, I've been there mm -hmm. and- there's a positive, there's a way to turn this around. There's a way to pivot. There's a way to change your mindset. Um, and that, I mean, that's, again, I told, when you said that, I'm like, I love it, dude, because we're doing a podcast for the same reason. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you, when you get those texts, I had a guy, uh, text me that he sent an episode to his daughter and it made her step up in the relationship that she was and make some demands that needed to be made. Um, for him to kind of get cleaned up, I guess that's the best way to yeah. nutshell tell it, but and so he said, Hey man, thanks for doing this. Thanks for bringing that guy on. Thanks for, you know, my daughter's See, going awesome. through this exact same thing. And I'm just like, man, like, 
And so, yeah, when you get stuff like that, it's like, okay, this is worth it. Yeah. You know, this is, and, and you're busy. I mean, we're both busy. And for, to take a night every week to sit down and do this is, I mean, I, I enjoy it or I wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it takes time. Honestly, so. this is what fulfills me. Like I was saying, my purpose, this is my purpose. This is why I, I truly believe this is why God put me on this earth and put me through the struggles that I did because he wanted to use me as a, as a beacon or somebody just to help other people. I, I truly believe that. And I truly believe that we all have that gift within us, that God given gift that is purpose driven to serve others. Hmm. I truly believe that, but to get there, you have to get uncomfortable. Yeah. Yep. If you truly want to use that gift, you got to get uncomfortable. Yeah, you and probably most, have to get uncomfortable to see it. And most people don't want to get uncomfortable. Yeah. I didn't want to for many years. I still don't. It's still hard for me. It's still a push for me. It's still something that I have to I have to work on every single day. Again, I'm an ordinary man. Just with a mindset now of I'm growing. If you're not growing, you're dying. Yeah. So I just want to grow in my life. I've lived, you know, 15 years of my life with a scarcity mindset thinking, why is this happening to me? You know, life is happening to me. This sucks to that pivot of, man, Alex, you actually woke up today alive next to a woman who loves you for who you are. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. There's nothing else you need. Life's happening for you, not to you. Yep. Just go with it. Yeah. And I've, I've shouted out Eric Thomas on this a few times, but that was the pivot for me. Um, like I'd always worked hard. I tried to be positive. Um, I want to say I was married when I found Eric Thomas. I'm sure I was, um, I mean, it's been 10 years I've been married now, so I'm sure I was married at the time. And, but it was a huge shift for me of being like, I was just nose to the grindstone because I didn't know anything else. Mm -hmm. I had no purpose. I had no, I mean, I just worked so I could cover bills, you know? And And how many people are going like uh, right now like that? Oh, the majority. Exactly. hundred percent. So if you give somebody hope like, Hey, look, there's other opportunity. There's other things you can do. There's other fulfillment that you can have in life. You don't have to just resort to the status quo of what society wants you to do or be or, or your, your family do or be. Like, yeah. And I'm not saying that everybody should be an entrepreneur, go out there, build businesses and stuff like that. We need employees and it's not bad to be an employee. It's not bad to go work for somebody. It, it's not. Like, don't get me wrong. I know multiple people that... They don't want to do that. They love going to their nine to five and that fulfills them. Great. Are you doing it to the best of your ability? Right. Then. Right. Like we had, we had Mitch Hancock come on and he talked about being the best entrepreneur that he could. Exactly. And I loved it. I was like, dude, that's because entrepreneurs thrown around so much, especially Mm -hmm. when you are one, it's just, everyone's always taught. It's it's not like a one up thing, but it's like, hey, I'm also an entrepreneur. Everyone talks about it. Yeah. And so he came in, man, and he was proud to be an entrepreneur. And I loved it. I'm yeah, like, more people need to hear this. It's true. Like it's okay. Honestly, I I used to do that where I'd go and like, you know, you go to Walmart, you go to, to Home Depot or Costco, and you'll just look at those people. It's like, man, why did you settle for this job? And I would have that mindset going, like, why did you settle? But then in all reality, first and foremost, Alex, you were so depressed, broke, and so messed up that you wouldn't even go out and get that kind of job, Hmm. first and foremost. So how can you say that about them? Secondly, how do you not know that that just blessed their family and then they are taken care of and they're happy? You don't know. Right. You don't know their situation. I had a a good mentor of mine, um, George, a guy that, that works. I actually work for him. He owns the company that I work for. Um, he gave me some great advice a few years ago. He's like, Alex, you need to treat everybody as if they're having the worst day of their life. 90% of the time you're going to be right. Hmm. And that hit home with me going like, dude, just be empathetic. Yeah. Because we don't know what's going on in other people's life. And it hit home because I lived my life so long in a depressed state, anxiety, depression, you know, not wanting to live, just feeling worthless and just feeling down, but I hit it so well. Like I tell my story, people that knew me back then are like, really? Yeah. Really? No. Yeah, really. There'd be weeks that I wouldn't get out of bed. 
you know? And it was because of those people that treated me with empathy and, and, you know, like, Hey, you're, you're, you're going to be fine. Everything's good. You know, it's one of the main reasons why I'm still here, you know? And it hit home because like how many other people are going through that in their life that need that kind of friendship? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, I need you to be able to open up about it. Exactly. And that's a couple of people we've had on here. I'm just, after we get done, whether I knew, whether they're my really good friends or not, I'm just like, man, like, thanks for bringing that up. Thanks for, I mean, that's the whole reason we're here. And yeah. so, but yeah, dude, let's, let's jump into some of those struggles. Let's go through some of that stuff. I want, um, I, I kind of cheated. I just listened to the solid <laughs> podcast you were on again. Um, and it, like, I don't just want to echo what was said on there, but it was so good. I, I, uh, let's go through some of those struggles and then, yeah. um, I'll just let you take it over. I mean, I know there was a divorce. I know there was, um, thought about taking your life, kids. Um, but go ahead. I'll let you take it. I mean, starting off first, I, I, you know, growing up, I always wanted to be somebody. I always felt like I would, I had a higher purpose or anything like that. I didn't know what it was. And so the first thing I did, I grew up with a dad that was an entrepreneur. He shifted his mindset when I was, became a teenager, but I was raised with him always wanting to be an entrepreneur. So I had that mentality, that mindset, like, I'm going to go start something. I'm going to go start a business. I'm going to go work for myself, you know, sales, whatever. You know what I'm saying? We traveled a lot. You know, I saw the freedom that he had. Um, did he make a ton? I actually don't know because we were, he was happy and he didn't show that it wasn't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He, I had the perception that we were, we were great. And so I always wanted to do that. So after a two year stint down in Mexico, um, I came back and I got into real estate. So I started selling real estate and took off and had fun. 2008 hit, you know, I'm going to go through the, you know, the cliff notes of it because a lot of people have heard it. Sure. Not your, not your listeners. Long story short is like 2008 hit and I lost everything. And it hit me so hard because we hear those statistics. I'm a st I call myself a statistic of 2008. And I know many friends that were in the same boat as me. Mm -hmm. And the problem that I had with it, it, it hit me so hard is because I wanted it so bad that I clinged onto the material items so much. I let those define who I am. I let those material items, everything that I worked for, everything that I was doing define me instead of me defining me, who I was becoming, who I was. Does that make sense? Yeah. Go a step deeper though. Are you talking like boats, razor, trucks, I mean, or what are you talking? House. House, cars. Okay. You know, um, I was in, I was investing in real estate back then. I was 24, thought I was the king, you know, we're making good money. Yeah, I was doing okay. I was doing For not a 24 year old. Yeah. I wasn't doing bad. You know, I had some investments out there that was flipping some lots. Um, I was having fun. Yeah. You know, but I was spending it faster. Than I can, I was making it. That was my problem. I was stupid. I was young. I was naive. Um, thought it would never end. And when that crash hit, you know, I had, I was owning, I owned my own business then. I was partners in my own brokerage you know, and everything. And, and when that happened, not only did I lose everything, but I start, I act, literally lost my mind. And I say that because I got in such a depressed state, you know, when you lose your house, when you lose those, all those cars, those possessions that you literally identified as, I felt like my identity, I lost my identity. Yeah. And then you have those people come out and say, well, I told you so. I told you not to get into real estate. I told you you should have just gone to school told you you should have finished, you know? And so you get that self-doubt going, oh shit, maybe that's, maybe they're right. And so you frantically are just searching for other ways to make money, other ways to, to provide wanting instant gratification, you know? And I was going, and I was just going through the motions. I was chasing money. I was chasing life instead of living my, living life and serving others. You know, I was do, do, doing so I could have everything I needed. Now, is that because you, do you think you sought acknowledgement from other people of having the house, having the car? I mean, where, so where did that come from? Because I guess the reason I ask is you're tying it to everything that you lost. That's where your validation was. So, mm -hmm. so what, what took your validation to that? Does that make sense or no? No, it makes total sense. It was, I just always wanted to do more than what my parents did. 
Okay. I always wanted just to, to do something. You know, even back then, I would always look at those, man, if they can go do that, if they can own that kind of stuff, why can't I? Yeah. You know, that, yep. like, if, if they can do it, anybody can do it kind of concept. And I had that mentality, like, I don't give a shit what it takes. I'm going to do it kind of thing. But instead of working on myself, it was like, I'm going to go work hard so I can have everything. And that will make me become the person I need to be. Got you. You know what I'm saying? Yep. That's what I was trying to dig to. Yep. So I can, I can work, work, work. That will give me all the possessions I need. And those possessions are going to f- define the person that I'm going to be. Yeah. And when all of that went away, well, what happened to that being that was Alex supposedly, you know, got it figured out, living got on it the figured high. out, living on the high, making more money than, than really anybody in his family at the time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, wait, where, what now? I lost everything. Yeah. And so that put me through a world when I had had, we had one kid I was with my ex-wife that time. We had one kid, one on the way, Allie, my, my daughter. And we were just, that's when their struggle really started. I started living with my family. My parents had to move into my parents' house, moved in with my in-laws up north, back and forth, rentals, back and forth, couldn't keep a job, wouldn't get out of bed. Always had real estate that I fell on. I always was selling here and there every once in a while, but I was always looking for that, the grass is greener somewhere else. Got to go jump to, try to do that because I always wanted that instant gratification. I wanted to get it back. And it got to the point where, you know, 2012, um, I got so depressed, so anxiety, like I would have panic attacks, but I would hide them all. I'd yeah. hide my panic attacks. I'd hide all my stress. I'd hide all that. When I felt one coming on, I'd go get in the car and drive away, go have it and then come back kind of thing. I would literally so hide my it. wife didn't know. She knew I was depressed. Sure. But not to the extent that I was portraying. Yeah. Got you. You know, I, I remember in, in 2012... I think it was 12 when I tried to, when I I was done one day, I was just pissed off at the world, pissed off at myself. Just like, you're an idiot, dude. You're not doing anything right. Your kids were better off without you. That's the kind of stuff I would tell myself on a daily basis, on a daily basis. You know, God's mad at me. I wasn't paying enough tithing because I would get that too. Like, so God's mad at me. So why would I even pray to him? He's not going to help me anyway. I had a really bad relationship with God. Didn't even know he really existed back then. Stopped leaving, you know, and that's been a whole struggle in itself. Getting back to that, really defining that part of my life. Um, I remember in 2012, I think it was 12. I took a whole bunch of pills. I don't even remember what kind of pills they were because I was done. Mm-hmm. And I was so pissed because all it did, it made me sick and I just threw up a ton and I got, I remember afterwards, I was like, I got so mad at myself, so down, so I couldn't even kill myself. Right. I was like, I'm so, such an idiot. I can't even do that right. Yeah. It's just another, it's just another, another failure. Yeah. You know? And I look back on that going, dude, how far down were you? I was down bad. And I lived my life like that. Like, I mean, all the way up until 2017. 16, 17 is when it finally started like, hey, you really got problems. You really got issues. And I think it was like 13, 14 or 15, I got actually diagnosed with PTSD. Like a clinical diagnosis. Hey, um, you know, I started going to therapy back then. At, I think it was 2016, actually. And the therapist I was going to, the psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever it is, he actually is like, dude, you've got PTSD. And I, at first I was like, what are you talking about? PTSD? That's only for like people at war and yeah, that kind of soldiers. And yeah. No, that was such a traumatic experience for you losing everything that you gain, you got PTSD. I was like, crap. Uh, and that was a shock to me. I like, bet. what the hell? And that's when Xanax came in my life. And that was in a whole other struggle, you know, pop a Xanax, anxiety attack. It wouldn't hit fast enough, pop another one. And then I'd be comatose for like, a week, huh. you know, so a lot of struggles Yeah, that way. And I think one of the defined, I, I, I've talked about this in other episodes that I've had. Um, I think everybody in life has crossroads. A crossroad that where they, you know, you come up to that crossroad where it's a fork in the road where you can choose this way or this way. Normally one of the roads is, is an easier path. Yeah. And so most people, what do they do? 
We go that way. They go nice that way. Nice paved street. Nice road. paved street. But when in all reality, if they go the road that looks, that's the way they really need to go. Um, everybody has those in their life, decisions they have to make. And for me in 2016, I it was one that, that was, that was really one of the defining moments. That was really the part when I got really close to committing suicide to the point where I kissed my kids goodbye. I was done and woke up. I was like, I actually really didn't sleep the night before. Um, kissed my parents goodbye. And the only reason why I'm sitting here today is because I got a phone call from my son going, dad, I want to play baseball with you when you come home from work. That was a crossroad. Yeah. For me, that was something that the kid saved my life. He's my hero. And I had a decision right there to understand and know like, dude, you have no purpose in you, but he has purpose in you. You have to be there for him. You're a shitty father. I would tell him, I told myself, oh, you're a shitty father, but he still loves you and he still wants to play baseball with you. So I was like, okay, that's when I really knew I needed help. And I started going down that train of really, really diving deep of where the suffering came from, the triggers of the PTSD and everything like that. A lot of the triggers were from religion. A lot of triggers were from, you know, um, thinking that God wasn't going to help me or anything like that. And just a whole bunch of stuff. And so I, I started weaving and, and through that personally and getting to a point where 2017 went through a, a, a difficult divorce. It wasn't, it was difficult. All divorces are difficult. Sure. Don't get me wrong. Um, I look back on it now and it was hard, but it was necessary. At first I felt like a failure but now I know it was the best thing that, that happened to both of us. Even she's happy, remarried, has a beautiful, two beautiful other kids with, with her husband. You know, we get along for the most part because we have to for our kids. And, yeah. You know, it is what it is. And so, but it, it, it helped me grow into the person I needed to become. That makes sense? Yeah. No, it, 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 as you're going through this whole thing, I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, you had to go through that. I did. Because you're when you're going to benefit this through your life, you're going to look back and be like, I had to, that was my crossroad. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm at where I'm at now, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road is because I chose that road. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, um, 2017 though, was, it was another defining moment that, 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 that crossroad of, of choosing that divorce and, and, and going down that path, you know, I felt like another failure to my kids. Like I'm breaking up my family. What am I doing? You know what I'm saying? And it wasn't until again, my son, you know, that story, Yeah, it was bringing him home. We went out mountain biking up in a uh, park city and I had to get him home by Sunday night. He was 14 at the time, Tate, my oldest one. And he looked over me out of the blue. He's like, dad, I'm so glad you divorced mom. And I looked over, I was pissed. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. He's like I broke up the, what are you talking about? He's like, I love the father I have today versus the one I had before. Wow. All sense of failure went away. I knew I made the right decision. I knew I was on the right path. A crossroad. Yep. I was like, okay, now I just got to figure my own crap out. And so, you know, started getting back into real estate, started selling again. And, and yeah, I mean, it, I, I never really financially was able to make it though. You know, I, I, in 17, like, yeah, it was like the end of 17. I, I, I met my now current wife, Keisha. Um, and I don't know what she saw in me, man. <laughs> Honestly, to this day, I look back, I was a deadbeat drunk, like just through a divorce, not knowing what, just given like just a yes man to my, like, whatever, I'm a failure here, have whatever, you know? And, and, drinking a ton, not doing anything. I was actually selling boats because I couldn't even go to work at real estate and I needed to make something. I needed to figure out like, no, you need to go do something. Yeah. So luckily I had friends that were like, Hey, come to sell boats with me, you know? And so I was selling boats. I was on the lake. I was just like, okay, this is cool. Yeah. Still not making any money. You know what I'm saying? And it got to the point where it's like, okay, I got to figure out what I'm doing. So I got, started selling real estate again. And 19 was really a pivotal point in my, my life. Um, 
back in 2012, I got my broker's license in real estate for, I always kept that active. That was one thing I looked back. I was like, I wonder why I did that. But I always kept my real estate license active and paid up all the, I figured out a way to pay all the dues, make sure I was active. And I always look back going, man, that was always been my fallback. And I decided like in 19 is like, well, you're always treating it as a fallback. You might as well just put it as a for- forefront and do something with it. Yeah. So I became a broker with a, a startup here in town. My job was to recruit and train agents how to sell real estate. Well, I knew how to sell real estate. I didn't know how to recruit. So I just started talking to people and sharing my story and sharing where I came from and sharing what I was doing and just being genuine and open. Ended up helping that that company recruit 40 people in a year. Wow. And it was fun. 2019 was fun. It was like we were growing. I didn't recruit them all. Like the the ownership helped. And it was just a fun time. Yeah. Gaining relationships, gaining yeah, friends. Yeah. Like I started finding purpose. Right. My own purpose. Like, holy crap, Alex, you're a good leader. I don't know what it is, but you, you've got something. You got cares. You're charismatic. You, 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 you know something. I was still going through my depression. I was still working on, on other things, but I felt fulfilled. Yeah. It was the first time in a very long time that I actually felt fulfilled for my actions. You know, you always feel fulfilled when you're looking at your kids. You always feel fulfilled when you're, you know, with that, that kind of stuff. But actual what you do. Right. The first time. Comes from your actions, exactly. your choices. And I was like, dude, your wins. You're, you're doing it. And, but I still wasn't making any money. <laughs> you're like, I'm starting to smile some more. But I was. The money ain't there. It wasn't there. <laughs> still struggling. I was living with my girlfriend at the time, you know, there was tension there because you were, I wasn't making any money. You know, she still had to provide a lot. She, she, like, honestly, Derek, when I say, I don't know what she saw in me, dude, I don't know what she saw in me. I yeah. was a broke drunk, just trying to find who I was. She saw, she's like, ah, oh, you're a diamond in the rough. I saw potential. I see potential. She, you're like, she, I'm glad you're right. Well, she, <laughs> she is, the potential's still there. You're not there yet. <laughs> but <laughs> she's right. Honestly, I am a, I don't know how she puts up with me. I love that woman so That's much. That's awesome. Because we can go into that too, relationships and that yeah. down the road. But, but I, I realized that I still wasn't. So I started butting heads a little bit with the ownership of that company and going, hey, I need to make more. Well, in 2020 March, instead of getting all my bonuses that were supposed to kick in and stuff like that, they actually let me go. Hmm. I was like, okay. I remember the phone call I, I called Keisha, and I was like, you never guess what. They let me go. She's like, okay, babe, I love you, but I think it's time you give real estate up. Wow. Like, we need to go find you another job. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I, I was like, okay, maybe it is 16 years doing this, actually not doing this. Maybe you're right. I, I make the joke now. It took me 16 years to actually figure out how to sell real estate. <laughs> That's what it so, took. Though. <laughs> it took 16 years. <laughs> um, but it wasn't, it, I, I just, I would remember sitting in the parking lot in, in Main Street Plaza. I just sat in my truck going, okay, now what? 60 grand in debt, no income living with my girlfriend, barely could pay my truck, could barely even for, afford child support. I was back on child support. I was like, now what? Starting over. Yeah. 38, 39 years old. Like, what the hell are you doing in your life? This is literally two and a half, three years ago. Right. To put it in perspective. At the beginning of a pandemic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, we didn't even know. That was like... Right. That came out March 20th. March 7th, I got... I got <laughs> I decided then, I, I got a call from one of my friends, good friend of mine, Luther. Um, he's like, Alex, you don't understand it right or right now, but you just got the best promotion in your life. For some reason, that resonated with me. And I think the reason why it resonated with me is when I started recruiting and coaching and, 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 and doing the broker position and really building people up, I naturally started working on myself. Right. So I naturally just started being so I could do what I needed to do to have the things that I wanted in life. That whole mental thing shifted where I gradually, I I started, I remember back in 2019, 
I realized really quick, I don't know, remember if I heard on a podcast or something, but I realized when I was up to date writing in my gratitude journal, actually writing my gratitudes down every single morning, planning out my intentions, planning out what I was planning on doing, and just being genuine about me, I realized that my day would go better and I wouldn't get as depressed. And so I started focusing on every single morning, writing in my gratitude journal. Every single morning, I'd write down my intentions, what I intend to do today. Did I hit them all? No. If I hit hit 70% of them, I'm okay. Yeah. You know, I'd start writing down uh, an inventory of what I did and what I could do better, you know? And sometimes my gratitudes were, dude, I'm grateful that you got out of bed and you got to work today. That was it. Yeah. But I was still pretty damn grateful that I got out of bed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like there's going to be levels through that entire thing. And that's exactly. the level you are at or, or the level that you needed to be at that day. And I truly believe that that's why when he told me, he's like, Alex, this is a promotion. You're, you're fine. I truly believe it's because of that work that I started doing to myself. Yeah. Cause the, if you weren't at that point, then you'd be like, whatever guy, yeah, <laughs> like, I dude, I just got let go. How could I have a promotion? I would have opened a bottle, gone home, locked the door and said, I'm done. Yeah. I really would have. Right. That's what I would have done, but I didn't. I remember sitting in there and I wrote three declarations down on my, uh, on my journal in my car or on a piece of paper. I said, number one, F it. F getting a paycheck and relying on other people to pay my pay my bills. Never again. F what people think. I don't care. I'm going to do this for me. I'm not going to do it for my my then girlfriend, now wife. I'm not going to do it for my kid. I'm going to do it for me. Yep. I'm going to be selfish. Number 2, I'm going to stop chasing life and start living it. Because how much life did I overlook by chasing it? I didn't live life. I, I I didn't live 15 years of my life because I was too worried about chasing stuff that was non-existent. And number three, stop chasing money and just start serving people. Because I noticed when I was serving people, I was happy. Yeah. And that morphed into, you know, you want to earn more, become more and serve at a higher level. That's it. Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. And I, and I was like, okay, I'm going to still sell real estate. I'm, this is all I know. This is what I know what to do. And I made a decision there. You're going all in. You're going all in. So I hired a real estate coach and I went all in. I went all in. Like I had to borrow the money to hire the freaking coach. I didn't tell my wife that at first, <laughs> but I had to borrow the money from another friend, three grand. And I was like, I'm, I'm doing this. Yeah. That year was one of the better years I had in a very long time. I ended up selling 28 houses. Um, started getting phone calls from other offices because I didn't know what I didn't know. I guess recruiting 40 agents in a, in a year, like being a broker of being, it's pretty good. And so I was like, cool, that's cool. I was naive again. Yeah, I was yeah. like, sweet, let's do this. But I turned them all down. I was like, no, I want I wanted to prove to myself that I can do this. So I turned them all down. I needed to prove to me, build the self-confidence exactly. that I could do it. It wasn't until November that I decided to take the position I am at today currently as a broker over at Century 21. And the only reason why I took it is because I realized really quick, proximity is power. Who you surround yourself with, you become. Yeah. And I... I really looked up to the ownership that this company have, that has. I mean, they've become dear friends of mine now, but I wanted to emulate them. I wanted to learn from him. I wanted to get coached by him. So I was like, okay, naturally, I'm going to go work for him. Here I am. Here I am. <laughs> yeah. And that was the best decision I ever made because my growth expanded to a level that if I were to look at where I am today, I would never imagine it. Right. And where I'm going, it's mind-boggling to me that in three short years, I can go from where I was to where I am and where I'm going. Yeah. Now, has my life been all peaches and cream perfect? No. Oh, hell no. <laughs> no. Hell no. Ask my wife. Like, we struggle. We, I'm a 
I'm an old bitter man sometimes, a lazy ass that doesn't want to do jack shit. Part of my French, but I don't. Like yeah. I am a human by nature. I, I, I would rather sit on the couch and do nothing. And sometimes I do. And sometimes it's a struggle of mine. Sometimes I am a stubborn ass that doesn't, you know, doesn't put up with stuff. And I know that that's my weakness. Sometimes I still do get depressed. But the difference is, is now I have that record in the past where, dude, you can get over this. Yeah. I have the confidence that I can get over it now. Well, and people that are at that point need to understand that. Like you just need to start getting some wins. You need to start. Suffering is temporary. Yeah. That's the biggest thing I learned. Any suffering that we, that happens in life is temporary. Tomorrow will come. I used to say tomorrow will come whether you're dead or alive. So you might as well live today the best you can. You know? I like it. You, you might as well. Yeah. You might as well just be in the present of the day. And that's something that I currently, even to this day, struggle with, being in the present. Me too. And I'm always, you know, looking in the future. I'm always like, okay, what next? What, what am I going to do? I never live in the past anymore. The past of the past, it is what it is. I can't do anything about it. Yeah, take I'll, off the rear view. Exactly. Yeah. But I catch myself all the time living in the present or living in the, living in the future too yeah. much. And I notice I am because that's where anxiety comes from. Yep. You know, if you're living too much in the, in the future, you're going to be, you're going to have anxiety. So if, if you live with anxiety, check yourself, are you living in the future too much? Are you wishing for a life that you currently don't have that you see other people living vicariously through somebody else? If that's the case, step back and. Yeah. Look around, detach a little bit. Look just around. Be present. Yeah. Just be present. Go hug your wife. Go right. hug your kids. I guarantee you that anxiety will go away. So, yeah, dude, writing down. So if you, how long have you done this gratitude journal or I don't know what you call it, if you call it that or not. I just, it's a gratitude journal. Um, I, I do. It, it's, you know, I started it actually, it was back, it was 2019. I started doing it and, and again, I did it for me because I noticed that it helped me get through my depression. Like, cause I still struggle, even to this day, I still struggle with, you know, being depressed and, and having anxiety and, and, and really focusing on. I don't know if it's hereditary or not. I, I don't, I don't understand the science of it. So I don't want to really, you know, say yay or nay. Yeah. All I know is I do struggle. Um, but I also know that when you sit back and just realize how much we are blessed, we'll really think about this, Derek, what did you drive here in? Car. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Was it air conditioning? Does it have a heater? I drove it because it does have a heater. <laughs> okay. So it has a heater. You drove here. Did you eat today? Yeah. And you're sipping on a, on a, on a drink over here. Right. You know, did you wake up this morning? I did. Next to a woman that loves you? Yep. You have a beautiful child? Hung out with them all day today. Really think about that. But yet it's so easy for us to bitch and moan about circumstances and other crap in our life that really don't have meaning. When in all reality, all meaning is in front of us. You know what I'm saying? I love it. I love it. I, I think that, like you're saying, people get so caught up of what they don't have or what they want to have that that's, and that's what I meant by like, just stop and just kind of look around at what you do have. Exactly. Yeah. When I, when I'm having a really hard day, that's what really what I do is I just sit down and go, Alex, you woke up. Everything else is a gift. Look at all these little, these little conveniences that you overlook every single day. I mean, I drive a beautiful, awesome truck. I've got, you know, all these little stuff. I've got my health. I got two hands. I got a heart that beats. I got two eyes. I've got a, I've got the opportunity to do this. Yeah. Do I really have that? I've got a lot of first world problems. Right. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, regardless of what your perspective is. Exactly. If it's that you woke up, it's that you woke up. It's that you drove a nice truck today. You drove a nice, you know, whatever that thing is, there's always something. I mean, I guess unless you don't wake up one day, but. But even then. Well, I mean, like if you're dead. Well. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like at any level, there's something. It's inevitable. Yeah. We're all going to die someday. But are we going to live our life in fear that that's going to happen? Or are we going to live our life that we want to make it the fullest life possible before that happens? Yeah. I was living my life that, oh shit, it's going to happen someday and I'm going to do it to myself. So I wasn't living life. Now I understand 
it is human nature. There's no way around it. We are all going to pass from this life. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I think is so interesting and I catch myself all the time doing is we treat time as the, it is the most infinite commodity that we have. I mean, think about it. How often have you told yourself, oh, I could do it tomorrow? Yeah, pretty often. How, I'll, 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 I'll help my wife do that, but we can do it tomorrow. Well, that's one thing I used to be really good at. And it's something I've caught myself at this last year because I, I would just stay up and get things done. Like mm-hmm. I wouldn't put things off till tomorrow. And more now, and I think it's because I am busier and I'm not as efficient as I should be, but there's things now where I'm like, oh, I'll just get to that tomorrow. Yeah. Time is the most finite commodity that we own. Yeah. The, the most precious finite commodity. And if we don't start treating it as such, we're going to let it slip by. And I caught myself, honestly, I fell hard this last few months. I actually fell pretty hard off my routine of writing in my gratitude journal. I was doing it really sporadically, um, you know, really being present with my wife and really, really focusing on work when I was at work and everything. And I noticed that my relationship suffered with my wife. I really didn't get much done at work. I wasn't happy. My health went down the drain. I mean, I, I actually gained like 15 pounds those last three months just because I didn't really care, you know? And it's amazing to me how quickly it went by. I'm human. Like I keep on saying, like, I'm not perfect. Yes, I coach. Yes, I, I help people with their mindset, but I do it because I need, I need it too. Yeah. We all need it. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you are the, you know, best person on the, in this planet, they still have faults, failures. They still have suffering. They still struggle. But one thing again, struggle is temporary if we choose it to be temporary. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you have to accept that, that it is. Yeah. You got to accept it. It's a choice. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited for life's going. My gratitude journal is something that, that I, I love doing. Um, it makes me happy and I challenge everybody. You just do it. I, it's hard. At first I'd sit down with a pen and paper. I couldn't write anything. Like I didn't know what to write. And so it was very, very superficial, very like, grateful for my family, grateful for my friend, you know, which is good. I'm grateful to have food. I'm grateful that I had a hot, hot shower, blah, blah, blah. But now it's gotten to the point where it's like, I'm grateful that I experienced what I did yesterday, yesterday. And I write why, because it helped me understand and realize that you're human. Yeah. I'm grateful that I had that miss up. I'm grateful that I had that success. And then you always, I go down the Y train with every gratitude. I call it the white train. Why are you grateful? Get deeper. If there's a person that I was like, I'm really grateful for such and such. And if I, if I write that, because I, I just let it flow, I'll take it to the next level and I'll practice the law of gratitude. I'll text that person afterwards. Hey man, just want to let you know, thank you. I'm grateful for you in my life. Wow. That's practicing the law of gratitude, yeah. taking it to the next level, you know? So go down the white train. Why are you grateful for it? Why are you grateful for him? Have you expressed that gratitude to him? Maybe he needs to hear it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's why I love it. It's because it's like, it's not only for me now. Now I'm putting this to someone else and getting in their feelings and exactly. letting them be aware that I'm thinking about them. Mm-hmm. And that's, and for me, that sets my whole day up. I, I'm a firm believer that that I, I've shifted my, my thought process in this. And it's, again, it's an evolving cycle that I'm going through. You know, my day consists of, you know, waking up. My morning routine is the most important routine of my day. Before business, before anything, it's me time. That's when I become selfish. That's when I, I work on me, my mindset, my growth, and what I need to do to finish out that day strong, Hmm. my morning routine. And so many people like, okay, they, they don't have one challenge it, get one. Yeah. Even if it's waking up consistently at the same time, does it make you uncomfortable? Then do it. Yeah. Because uncomfortable, that's where you're going to grow. And it's not even a 5 a.m. Super successful. It's a, just get uncomfortable, get uncomfortable. I don't care if it's 7 a.m. If you're so used to waking up at eight, that's what I do with some of my coaching clients, you know, 
to get them that feeling of un- uncomfortability. Cause I know growth only comes when you're uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, I'll ask them, I was like, okay, what time do you wake up? Okay. I wake up oh, anywhere between seven and eight. Sweet. Set your alarm right now. You're waking up at six every morning. No. Oh, you don't want to grow? Yeah. No, it's, I don't want to do that. Why? Oh, well, cause it's uncomfortable. I like laying I like, in bed. No crap. That's why <laughs> I want you to do it. You got to get that sense of uncomfortable. Because that's one thing I know. If you start keeping the little promises you make to yourself, even the little ones, Ed Milet says that. Yep. Start keeping the little promises you make to yourself, even waking up every single day at the t- time you tell yourself you're going to, what's going to happen to your self-confidence? Yeah, it's going to go up. You're going to start believing in yourself. What's going to have to happen to your self-talk? It's going to be more positive because you know that you can do it. You what's know gonna, you can set a goal and achieve it. What's going to happen to your routine? The d- are you going to be more animated? It's, I think that we're a creature of habit, so it's going to benefit you to have that routine. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. And that's all by one simple act. I'm not talking about multiple. I'm yeah. talking about just picking a time, waking up when you say you're going to. That's something I struggle with. Yeah. We I, all do. As you're saying this, man, I'm sitting here thinking of myself. I I was growing one of my businesses and I worked at it every day. Um, and I had to be there. I had to be in Hurricane, which is like a 20 minute drive from my house. I had mm-hmm. to be there at eight o'clock every day. Yeah. So I was up at seven, showered, drove over there. And even though it wasn't five or six, like I always had that. I had, and I was there six days a week. And, and I was, I'd be done at, you know, one or two or whatever I got. It was one of those jobs you just, you were done for the day when you got everything done, right? Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like a nine to five, right? And I've noticed myself now in the last year, probably, um, like my retail store now was kind of my day job where we sell safes, uh, gun safes, vault doors, all that. Yeah. And we open at noon because we typically do deliveries in the mornings. And so it was always me doing deliveries. I was the only one. Yeah. <laughs> and so, And now I've brought another kid on that's in high school. He's a senior this year and he's helping me with a lot of stuff at the store now. And so, yeah, there's days I don't have to really do anything till noon. Yeah. And I'm, I'm realizing that drive or that, like, I don't know if self-worth is the right word, but just, I'm starting to question it. Even Would it a be bit. self-confidence? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, mean it's really what it comes down to. And honestly, if you, I, I challenge you, yeah. do try that. I know. I'm try going just, to. Just try picking a time and do it for, do it for a month or do it for a, honestly, even a week Yeah, and just see how you feel. You, journal it. That's a big thing too. So many people are like, you really write in your journal? I do. I write in a journal because your life, if it's worth living, it's worth documenting. Wow. I like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Really think about it. If your life is really worth living, then it's really worth documenting. And do I write in my journal every day? I really try. I'm like 75, 80%. You know, the weekends kind of shift a little bit here and there. Um, but during the week, I'm I'm pretty consistent. Yeah. You know, and it's usually, like I said, the gratitudes. I do write down thoughts, daily thoughts. Hey, what what's going through your mind right now? It's going through like, uh, and the thing about journaling is you got to get vulnerable with yourself to ask yourself the hard questions. Like who really is Derek Lake? Who really am I? Yeah. What do I really want? What do I really want in 2023? What do I really want in life? If you start journaling and you start really answering those questions, you know, we always hear like the Ed Milets and the, the, you know, all the, all those guys talk about clarity is power. You know, I, 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 Tony Robbins says that a lot. Clarity is power. What does that really mean? Get clear, clear on what? Well, if you don't know who you are, you don't, how are you going to know where you want to go? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you got to get clear on who you are first. The only way to do that is to be vulnerable with yourself Write it down. Well, I think that's going back to my some days sleeping in type of thing. Because I've, I've in my mindset at the time, and I know I was wrong now, but doing that the last few months, I've been like, um, well, I've earned this. 
Like that was kind of my mindset. I've earned this, you know, I've worked my trash off. I've worked for 15 years. Yep. I've, and so like we're in our nice house and our nice bed. I've earned this. And I've realized it's, I've caught, I'm slipping. Like it's caught myself slipping because maybe one day I earned it, but not six months, <laughs> you know, not three months. <laughs> well, and like I was saying, like, I realized I had this realization literally like, it's an interesting. We're talking about this right now, literally like two weeks ago, a week and a half ago that I slipped bad these last few weeks. I had that same, that same feeling like, dude, you've made it. Yeah. You know, you're good. Like everything's fine. Like you don't really need to work on yourself anymore at the extent you were. In all reality, I need to work on myself even more because if I truly want to hit my goals, I need to become a better human being. Yeah. Cause it's not about achieving the goal. Right. It's about who you need to become. Well, and for me, like just personal experience, I'll share for me, it was back then, like, like my wife's a nurse practitioner. She has a master's degree. She earns a great living. Um, like depend on me financially. She doesn't hundred mm-hmm. percent. Um, obviously it depends on me to be a husband and to help out the things that I do. Yes. Absolutely. But I'm just thinking like back then when I was just driving and just hammering it hard, nothing like it didn't really mean anything because there was nothing there. Nothing depended on me. Nothing drove me to do it. I just did it. Mm-hmm. And then now I think like, well, I've made it in quotations. Right. And I, I look back and think, well, maybe six months ago, I thought I made it. I earned it. But now I have so much more looking up to me. I have so many more people looking at me. I have, you know, what whoever at the podcast that views this stuff, they're all looking up. They're all wondering what's going on mm-hmm. there. And so there's so much more, um, pr- not pressure, but what's the right word? I can't, I can't dig the right word out of here. Yeah, I think pressure. I think, uh, yeah, pressure. Pressure I mean, if you is really that the right word. It, yeah, yeah, it is pressure. And not even like a negative pressure, but there's just so you know that sense of urgency. Yeah, kind right. of thing. Like I'm getting not, oh crap, I really got to do something. I'm not verbalizing this very well, but I think, no, I, I think I, you know I, what I'm I, getting across. I understand exactly what you're saying, <laughs> and it's funny because you know I, when you start slipping and you start like getting off your routines and and really working on yourself, you realize that that goes away clarity. It's that clarity that goes away pretty quick. You yeah. lose it pretty fast. Right. You know, it's about, it's like, I, I kind of can correlate it to the gym. You know, you go to the gym, you work your freaking butt off for four or five months and you get this physique and you, and you're starting to look good and you literally can kill that in a week right? by eating crappy a week, three months worth of work. You can kill in a week. That's crazy to think about. Right. It's the same thing with our mindset. And that's why I call myself a kind of a mindset coach in a way, because without a positive mindset and actually believing in yourself that you could actually do it and having that clarity that you can go do it, you're not going to do anything. Yeah. I don't care how skilled you are. If you don't have the confidence in yourself, you're not going to do it. You're not going to have the discipline because you're not going to believe in yourself. Well, and I brought up that just, just backtrack for a second. I brought up that story about high school and having fake confidence because to me, it was always like the chicken and the egg. Mm -hmm. Like, so what comes first? You have to believe in yourself. Well, like, can you really believe in yourself if you haven't pushed through something? And so do you have to push through something to believe in yourself? You know what I mean? And so I always had that struggle. And I think for me personally, and it's different for everyone, that was kind of my, you know, the egg came first as I had this whatever you want to call it, fake confidence is what I've always referred yeah. to it as. And then that's what kind of got me through some of the hard stuff. And that's what pushed me And that. Then I started gaining the snowball. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's, but for other people, I don't know what it is. So like for you, what do you think that was? Whether you want to talk about 07 or 19. What shifted? Yeah. Like what was that first thing that kind of like you had to start gaining some momentum you had to, but is it the self-belief or was it something that you pushed through? Does that make sense? No, I, that, that's a that's a great question. You know, I don't think it was really one little thing. I think it was a, a multiple things combined. Okay. It was number one, having a woman behind me who supported me for who I was. I mean, she fell in love with me when I was in the depths of hell. Right. You know, right after a divorce, didn't have anything to the person I am today. Um, is our relationship perfect? No, I don't think really anybody's is. It's a work in progress, but I love the woman and 
she's my rock. She really is. It's having her, it's having, um, people that cheerleaders in my life, like you got this, you know, my parents in the long run supporting me regardless and loving me regardless, you know, um, friends, you know, so it's, it's the people that I surrounded myself with. I, I, I'm very blessed to have wonderful, wonderful people. Um, being involved in a CrossFit gym was huge for me. Like I, I start, I had a fitness journey too. That was, so I've yeah, only talked about skipped through that. Yeah. yeah well, I've only <laughs> had one side of my journey. I mean, back in 2012, I was 290 pounds. You know, I was, I called myself Buddha Alex. I'd, I'd smile and like my whole cheeks and everything would just like <laughs> scrunch up. It was great. Um, and I got involved in CrossFit back then. And, and that was the one thing that I could go and accomplish and feel accomplishment for achieving. Yeah. I hated it when I first started. I absolutely hated it because I couldn't finish a workout. Yeah. It was to the point of you couldn't do it the first day. Oh yeah. And then you went back and they said, we're on to something new. And you said, I'm not. I, I wanted to finish that <laughs> freaking workout. That. And so, but I felt like I got that sense, that self uh, confidence, like, dude, you got this. And it was the one place I can go and, and be around like-minded people that I just felt comfortable with. Like it became my little family to this day. I still go to the same gym. You know, I always will. They're uh, like the owners. He's a brother of mine. Um, I call him a brother, Chad. Yeah. You know, I, I love those guys. I love those people. I love that. I ended up coaching for seven years. Wow. You know, I needed to make money and that was one of my part-time jobs I had. I coached became a certified coach and loved it. Yeah. You know, um, it gave me a, a sense of hope in my life when I needed it the most. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I get it. And so I, I think that was a defining, but for me, it was the, what really shifted in my life. You know, looking back on my journey and what it is, it was that immediate decision to, and taking immediate action on a decision that I made. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, I decided sitting in the truck that day, you know, I, I've now, you know, my coaching side comes out where, okay, we're going to talk about the three C's now. You know, I got the four C's, you know, you got to make the choice, you know, and then you got to, you get, then you got to take a chance on yourself. You know, then you got to get clear on it. You got to get clear and then take a chance. And then that change will come. Got you know you. what I'm saying? Yeah. So when my, my four C's, you know, to make a choice, get clear on that choice, take a chance. Most people don't take a chance on themselves. So they the can actually part, do yeah. it and they get, they get that change. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I did those first three pretty clear. I got pretty damn clear on what I wanted. And I, what I wanted was I didn't want to live the way I was. I was done. I was done chasing life. Yeah. I wanted to live it. I was done like having other people provide for me. And I did have that little vengeance in me a little bit too, going like, oh, you're going to fire me. So I'll show you guys. A little dark matter. <laughs> oh, <there>. hell yeah. <laughs> I did. I was like, I'll prove to you guys I got what it takes. Sure. And I, I needed to prove myself, but it, there was that little. There's a little bit of fuel. And I don't think that's a bad thing having no. vengeance drive you in a good way. Like yeah. I, like I never went negative or anything like that, but I definitely let it drive me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I've done the same thing. Yeah. I think that I, I, there's, it's called a lot of things. I've called it dark matter for a while or I like the that. dark side. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of those negative emotions, but you, it's a different thing. It's not dwelling on that, looking in the rear view. It's not that you got to be able to flip that into a positive to drive you. Exactly. And I think, I mean, I think a lot of people do it. People call it different things and do it at a different level. You got to do it in a healthy way though. It, that's what I mean. I mean so there's, there's different ways to do this. Yeah. So I know some people are like, just man, dude, that's a little too much. <laughs> Dial that back a little bit. Calm the freak down though. <laughs> you know, so, and honestly to answer the, to keep on asking like what shifted, I, I think it's a continual shift. That's one thing I've noticed too, is it's a process. And you got to fall in love with the process. I think it's supposed to be, man. I think that like when, earlier you had said, you know, you went through things in a pivot. Like I love the pivot word. And because as you're growing and as you're learning and as you're going through life, I think it's supposed to pivot. Mm -hmm. I think that you're supposed to, if you're the same, if you have the same beliefs that you did 
what, 20 years ago, right after high school, you haven't learned anything. Well, like you haven't changed. And I, you bring up a good point there because if you get so clear on the vision of where you want to be in your life, if you can close your eyes and, know, and you, you have a clarity of like, no, I'm going to be here. This is where I'm going to be. Those pivots become smaller and keep you online to go up. You know, so you're right here. You want to be right here. You know, most people that aren't clear, what happens with those pivots? They get highs of highs and their lows are way down here. Yeah. And then they're way back up here and way down here. And there's really no, yeah, it takes them longer to get to there. But if you get really, really clear on where you want to go, now what happens to that pivot? It's yeah. nice, it, it follows the line. You still have a direction. You still have a goal. You still have where you want to go. And it's not such a sharp pivot. It's a gradual pivot. No, hey, hey you're offline. Got to go this way. Oh, no, no, come back down. You don't want to get too cocky. You know, I catch myself that too. Is like what you were saying. It's like, ah, oh, I've made it. Yeah. You know, I'm at the high of high. Oh, I'm there, I'm there. And then something will happen. It's like, no, that's, no, I just got humbled. You yeah. know, you know, it's, you still got, it's a process. And well, that's one thing I've learned in life is there's no such thing as a destination. You're always going to be climbing your Everest. You always will. Yeah, you should. Yeah. If you're not climbing, what are you doing? You're dying. Yeah. You're going to die on that hill. So if you're not climbing, you got to do it. And there's no such thing as the top because once you get to that peak, there's going to be another one. So don't expect it. Enjoy the process and the, the journey. Continue to grow every single day. You know, I love what I, Ed Milet always says. I am chasing the better version of myself every single day. Yeah. You know? I love that. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a fix to social media. That's a fix to a lot of that anxiety. It is. Quit looking at the likes of other people and what they have or what they fake have, you know, whatever vehicle they rented for the day. Exactly. Like, are you better than yesterday? Yeah. That's all that matters. And I love, you know, if you have not read his new book yet, read it. I've read, read a few of it. I'm not, it I'm going to finish it. One more. Okay. Just go out and do 1% more every single day. One more. That's and where did that come from? Do you know? Huh? Do you know where that came from? That title and yeah, from more? from his dad. Yeah, just one more day. Great story. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. yeah, that's actually a goal that I have. I want to I want to meet that guy someday. So yeah, Ed, if you're listening, yeah, I'm just joking. Well, <laughs> anyone that is hasn't been exposed to Ed Milet, look him up. Oh if yeah, he, he pro. I love Rogan because there's so many different things and. And you can kind of pick if you want a serious or a comedian or a, a mm -hmm. scientist, you know, whatever. So there's a lot of different things. Other than why I like Rogan for that one reason, Ed Milet probably has the best podcast out there. I agree. And the reason why I, I agree with you on that is while I was going through my, you know, really, really just diving into the self-improvement, like, okay, you need to better your mindset. You need to better you. I really resonated with his story, his life, and just who he is. Yeah. And it's easy to resonate with somebody that's gone through it the same way. Right. Our podcast. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and he's just a he's a stud. Yeah. I love what he's doing. I love the the I mean, he's helped me change my life. Yeah, I, I consider him a mentor that I've never met. Right. Same. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So him and and then I shout out Andy Frisella all the oh, time. Yeah. And the thing with Andy is I'm like, you know, we're in Utah. We're I'm LDS. Like we're surrounded by LDS. We're yeah. surrounded by religious people if they're not LDS. And it's like, if you can handle the F word, and Andy is he's right there with Ed. Oh, yeah. I think Ed casts a little bigger net because there's not so much language typically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm the guy and I've had this conversation. I have three older brothers and we were all very competitive, all the traditional sports, everything. And I was always like talked down to cause mm -hmm. I was the youngest and yeah. the smallest at the time. And so it was always, <laughs> my mom's going to think this is terrible because she'll listen to this, but like quit being a puss or yeah. be stronger, be bigger, be faster. And it was always like a negative energy thing. So when you bring up that that dark matter, like yeah. I drove, that drove me when I was a kid and, and it drove me too much. I was an angry kid because of it. Right. And <laughs> yeah. so I've seen that other side of it. And I, I think that it programmed me though. So the Andy stuff, the, the David Goggins stuff, like those guys that are, it resonates with you. Yeah. Like, and then my brother, Adam, who had a lot of, I don't even know how to say it. Like he, he was 
great in sports, super athlete, um, college, you know, offers everything. Yeah. Um, starting, starting varsity when he was, I don't know, 10th grade sitting when he was ninth grade. Like anyway, he always had like reassurance and, and positive and all this stuff from his coaches and my parents. And and so that's what drives him. Mm -hmm. And so if he would listen to Andy Frisella, he'd be like, what is this? You know, it would not hype him up. If anything, it would like bring him down. Yeah. He needs like the, the Trent Shelton's and stuff like that. (laughs) Right. He needs positive reinforcement. And, and me, I'm like, no, dude, I want the guy that's like, quit being a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> like, no. That's what's going to get me going. Yeah. I, I, I like Ed, <laughs> Andy for Cause he just tells it how it is, yeah. you know? And I agree with you on there, but there's so many people on there that you can listen to. There's so many, like, there's so much, there's so much good out there that it's, I don't know. Well, it's let's like, go back to how do you utilize the internet? Exactly. You know, are you on there looking at news about people getting bombed and stock market crashing or are you, or are you trying to search something out positive to get you through the day or to uplift you or maybe motivate you for a minute? Yeah, that's exactly right, man. Yeah. So, um, dude, let me, let's talk about one more thing. If you got time, I've got, Um, I've got time. We can keep going. I'm fine. I, uh, I want to go through relationships a little bit because you've brought it up a few times. Um, I like, I have a great relationship with my wife. We obviously we've had our ups and downs, um, usually because of me, usually because I'm pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing mm-hmm. and pushing. And, and she's a, she's a high achiever. Um, like I said, master's degree, she was super young and she looks at me thinking like, I'm just always pushing. I, I use the analogy on my podcast. I push against the brick wall all the time Yep. and I never stop and look around at how far I've pushed that wall. There's just always a so close to me, I don't look around. Yep. And so it puts a lot of stress on both of us because I do that. Um, but I, I think that same as you, I am nowhere near the person I am without her support and her behind me. Yes. Um, and I, I see other relationships, whether that's other guests or friends or family members or whatever. Um, I've seen other relationships where I'm like, dude, like that's going to be hard. Like if you want to do this, be- just because of the relationship and the expectations that are there, my personal opinion is that's going to be hard. Yeah. So yeah, relationships, like my relationship with Keisha, um, yeah, I mean, it's not perfect. Yeah. I won't lie. It's not perfect. But the one thing that we do have together is love, is that unconditional love that it's sometimes it's hard to see. You Sometimes you have to s- seek it and search for it. You have to look for it, but if you're not looking for it every single day, how do you know it's, you know what I'm saying? You'll yeah. lose it. Cause that's where we slip, dude, is yeah. I, I just get so focused on pushing and pushing and pushing and working and working and working and, and I've got to go do this delivery. I've got to build that holster. I have to cover this mail around. See, and that's, I've got to. That's the biggest thing that we're struggling with even right now is like, I'm so busy working, you know, three different businesses pretty much, yeah. you know, I've got three different businesses that I'm working on right now that, that I'm not giving my full attention. And it's a big thing because, you know, love languages is attention, affection, you know, service. So being present in your relationship is something that I struggle with the most. Me too. And something that I, and then when I'm not getting my needs fulfilled, I am the first one to cast blame, mm. which is the worst thing I can do. I'm the one that's like, you're not doing this. You're not doing this. When in all reality, it should be inside like, okay, there's something going on here. She's not, you know, stepping up to the plate. So what are you doing wrong? Yeah. Look in the mirror first. Look in the mirror first. And that's something that I've really recognized and realized even these past few days. That's like, look in the mirror, Alex, you're not such a saint. Yeah. You know, like I am a hard person to live with. I'm not the most... Yeah, I'm the same. You know, when I get, when I get on my wall, defense wall goes up, I spat off stuff. Like I, I, I do. And, and it's something I work on and struggle with every single day and I'm working to get better. But one thing I've realized is that the more and more I put her first and the more and more I work on myself and continue in my routines and actually focus on me 
the better our relationship is. Yeah. You got to remember that's one of the, the misconceptions. I, this is, this is the epistle of Alex. Okay. You know, we hear, especially in the area that we live, that a marriage should become as one. I think that's wrong. I, I, I'm going to agree with that. I already know where you're going and I'm going to agree with it. We are two individual people living parallel side by side. We still have our individuality. We still have our own uniqueness. We still have our own personalities. And the worst thing, and this is something that I'm working on, is to ask her to change those personalities and those. That change has to come within and I can't do it. I have to love that person for who they are. Yeah. And I think that's mis misled a little bit in society today, that becoming one. Really? No, I want her to be an individual. I still want her to have her independence. I still want her to grow because she wants to grow, mm -hmm. you know, and, and do what she wants to do. Just like your wife. She's a very independent woman, it sounds like, and she's very successful. Well, that didn't become, she didn't become that way because she's, you know, just with you. Does that make sense? Yeah, and me telling her. Exactly. <laughs> having ex all these huge expectations for her. Exactly. And that's something that I've been really struggling too is like, okay, really should we have expectations with our wives, with our spouses? If all reality, if the true love is there, I shouldn't expect anything from her. We have standards. Yeah. We have standards that we live by, but in all reality, I got to remember that I shouldn't expect anything from her because we show up together. Yeah. A hundred percent. And like I said, is it perfect? No. Do we struggle? Yeah. But I do know one thing is like, I wouldn't be where I am today without her. And I love that woman more than I've ever loved some, somebody. I, I won't lie to you. Like, like I've never had this kind of relationship where I love somebody as much as I love that woman. Well, so yeah, one thing I'll throw this in, dude, and then we can wrap it up. I, I've noticed that, well, let me, let's just timeline it. That's probably the easiest way to explain this. So first girlfriend, 15 you know, loved her, thought I was going to marry her. Mm -hmm. Right. And the next girlfriend later in high school, man, I loved her. I thought I was going to marry her, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, work my way till I get to my wife. Loved. I love her, loved her, married her. And I loved that person on our, on our day we were married. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years and there's different, you know, timelines through here, but you know, she graduates with her master's degree. So proud of her, loved her, mm -hmm. had her first kid, you know, loved her. And I look back at when we were married and I'm like, I didn't even know what love was, man. Exactly. You know what I mean? And so, and that's where I'm going with this. Now we're, we had our 10 year anniversary a couple days ago. And it's like, I just look at her and I'm just like, man, like I didn't even, I had no idea what I was even getting into. I didn't even know what love was. Mm -hmm. I thought I did. And I, I did at the time. I loved her as much as a 21 year old could love a girl. Yeah. You know, that didn't really have a ton of life experience. And, and now it's a, I think I needed to correct myself. I think I'm 33. <laughs> yeah. I'm turning 34 this year. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, as a 33 year old, I just can't imagine loving her more than I do now, you know? And, and, but it's a lot of the same thing, man. I'll use a word that you used earlier about yourself and what you had to do. Um, Amanda and I are selfish at times. Mm-hmm. And you need to understand that that's fine. And she needs to be selfish to who she is. And like, like I, and this is going to sound so small, but like this morning, um, I was available this morning so she could go run her 10 miles. She's mm -hmm. training for a half marathon. Right. And so like her being selfish, I need to go run those 10 miles. You need to be available for our son when he wakes up. And I'm like, okay, small, very small thing. But no, like, I don't want to be tied down. I want to go do it. I need to do at work. I want to go, you know, whatever. And so you have to allow the other person to have that little bit of selfishness to do what they need to do. And I think that if you don't, it ultimately is going to turn around into, they're going to resent you, I guess mm -hmm. is the best way to say it. Well, I've got a saying that you got to be selfish before you become selfless. Yeah. You, I like that. You got to be selfish. You have to learn to love yourself and do what you need. Like she has to do that run because that's what fulfills her. Right. Well, how do you expect her to show up in that relationship if you're not allowing her to be selfish so she can be selfless to you and your kid? Yeah. 
your yeah, child. And I'm far from perfect on oh, this. Oh, I'm I I yeah. trust me. Like it means I, I guess I bring it up because it's stuff I've noticed and I've yeah. learned over ten years. Yeah. And I'm working on it. You know, I mean, and we had a talk a little bit ago just about communication and everything I'm doing all the time. Oh, hell. Gosh. <laughs> I, trust me. I sometimes it's like, man, if you can't even get it right at home. Why are you out there trying to talk to other people how to do it? And that's why I tell everybody I'm not perfect at this. Like yeah. I'm struggle. I struggle just like everybody else. But I do know that progress happens over time but you have to continually choose that progression. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it has to be a, your choice. It has to be a choice. Like everything in life is a choice. Every decision is a choice. You got to choose. You got to choose to be happy. You got to choose your hard is what they say. It's hard to be fat and it's hard to go to the gym. Choose your freaking hard. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. It's hard to be broke and it's hard to be rich. Choose your freaking hard. Choose your hard. It's hard to have a shitty relationship. It's hard to have a good relationship. Choose your heart, you know? And so that was actually my number one goal that I set for the year is I want a deeper, more fulfilling relationship with my wife. I, when I sat down and started doing my goal setting, that's the only thing that came to my mind. Hmm. And that's my number one goal this next year is have a deeper, more communi communicative, is that a word? <laughs> I, I'm coining it. If it <laughs> yeah, is. it is now. Yeah. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. A relationship with my wife because that's all that matters. Right. Nothing in this world matters. The boats, the cars, the, all the crap, the vacations. I wouldn't want any of it if it's not with her. I want to experience all those things with her. So I got to work on that relationship first so I can have an amazing experience on whatever we get and wherever yeah. we go. You know what I'm saying? To be able to live your life. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want to do it with anybody else. Yep. Yeah. So work on that relationship first. And I, I struggled with that. Like for the last four months, we, our, our relationship was rocky. I'm not going to lie to you, but it's, it's a work in progress. Yeah. And it's some, that's the only way is up kind of thing. So love it, dude. Dude. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, man. Uh, I usually try to be an hour. We're coming well about an hour and a half so i love it really? yeah it's a great wow. we're good on time we're good on <laughs> okay. time i i want to bring you on again though there's so many Let's things that we can talk about i think we didn't even dive into half of who alex is oh so. no um but i love it um if someone wants to get in touch with you for coaching or advice or whatever how do people do that so honestly you can uh go to my instagram dm me at c underscore alex cornwall um or you can just email me ac at alex cornwall.com okay um, I'm getting a website built right now that it's not done yet. Follow the podcast. Follow the podcast. Give me some loves. Uh, yeah, it's it's, it's great. Called what again? So everyone the purpose remembers. driven podcast, and it's on Apple, Spotify, all the all yeah. the all the sites. And you can YouTube. Thing people don't know, and it's easier with mine because it's the Derek Leg podcast. So mm -hmm. you can either search the Derek Leg podcast or Derek Leg, and it comes up. Yeah, you can search Alex. Cornwall. So yeah, so with yours, you can also just search your name, and it comes right yeah. up. And honestly, if even if you just want to chat, hit me up. Like yeah. I am open to whatever you guys, I'm, I'm here. No, oh, I appreciate that. I, uh, and I hope people do, yeah. um, with different things that you've gone through or even just like, I like the coaching thing because it, it's just going to be bring more aspects and more things that you've talked to and been through with other people that yep. you can, that'll, you'll gain knowledge through. Does yeah. That makes sense. No, I, I love coaching people. So if you're interested in coaching, you know, I'm at, adding a few more clients this year. So Great. Yep. I'd love to, love to interview you and you interview me because it has to be a mutual agreement with the coaching. I don't just bring on anybody, but yeah. Great. All right, guys, that's episode 79, Alex Cornwall. Make sure you like, share, and comment. If you guys have any comments, you want to interact with me or Alex, go ahead and throw it on the podcast or DM us or however you get, you know, get, get your podcast and your clips. I uh, appreciate you guys being here if you're still with us and we'll see you guys next week.